Well, this is an important topic to the Cube. For about 15 years ago, we started our relationship with Irvine Ranch Water District. It's been a great program for us. We work with them to teach kids in the Irvine and Newport Mesa and kind of the Newport Beach area about um, water conservation and different messages that the water district needs to get out into the community. And we're their partner. And we've been doing this in classroom programs where we have these teachers and they take kids and they go see kids you know, all in that area every year. So background Mo, she is a wetland scientist. She got her undergraduate degree from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, I had to ask her about her, uh, her graduate, um, her undergraduate degree. Uh, it's in aquatic biology. Uh, and then she studied though in, um, uh, at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories in phycology. It's a new word for me, I don't know. What's phycology? That's the study of seaweed and algae. Uh, in addition to that, she's also uh, studied chemical oceanography. So uh, she's got a great background uh, in the oceans and uh, the kind of the mixtures of sea sea, sea, uh, sea grass and, and such. So uh, she, you can tell why she's a great fit for a conversation on wetlands. She worked up in the, um, the uh, Monterey Bay area as well uh, on the Central Coast Wetlands Project um, where that's where the Salinas Valley uh, um, basically uh, finds its way uh, down into the uh, Monterey Bay uh, before coming down here to uh, Newport and helping us out on our back bay area. So she's again with Irvine Ranch Water District. She's been longtime partners with us. And if you don't find her over there at Irvine Ranch and in the marshlands, you'll find her down at Dana Point where she's part of the Outrigger Canoe Club. She does free diving, sailing among the Channel Islands as well. So uh, Mo, we're very happy and pleased that you're able to join us tonight. Uh, and uh, give us an introduction into what's going on over there at the marsh. Thank you guys so much for coming here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. So my name is Mo and I am the wetland scientist at Irvine Ranch Water District. And I'm here to talk to you and with you about what I do so we can get started. Okay, so a little personal background, Joe just mentioned um, I was actually born and raised down here in Dana Point, and I attended Dana Hills High School where we were able to go down to Baja, California to do a 10-day field study of marine ecology, which completely changed my life. I thought it was the coolest thing to get your hands dirty, to camp on the beach, and do, actually do science for 10 days. Um, from there, I went to UC Santa Barbara where I studied aquatic biology and I became a scientific research diver um, studying kelp forest ecology all throughout the Channel Islands. I wanted to keep moving on that marine biology train, so I moved north up to, a, um, to Santa Cruz where I attended Moss Landing Marine Laboratories studying chemical oceanography and phycology, which is really what got me into the wetland world. So I studied um, saltwater wetlands or estuaries up north. Um, and then now I've transferred into freshwater wetlands. So now working with IRWD, I am their freshwater urban, wa uh, urban runoff treatment wetland scientist. So at IRWD, we have four main services. Our primary service is to provide clean and safe drinking water to everyone in our service area. Our second is to collect and treat sewage. We also produce and distribute recycled water. And then the last but definitely not least service is um, treating urban runoff. So that is very unique of IRWD and that is the area that I work in. So we have over 40 wetlands in our service area and they kind of keep on building as we develop different neighborhoods. And our main kind of crown jewel wetland is the San Joaquin Marsh. So to give you a little insight of where exactly we're talking about, 
This is in central Orange County. So the black line is the San Diego Creek watershed boundary. And then within that black line, everything is drained in that watershed out to the upper Newport Bay, which eventually makes its way out to the ocean. So this watershed is 120 square miles and it encompasses the entire city of Irvine, along with portions of Lake Forest, Newport Beach, Orange, Tustin, and then unincorporated Orange County. So as you can see on this map, there are two main drainage arteries, we call them. One being the Peters Canyon Wash and the other being the San Diego Creek. So both of them kind of join up and Peters Canyon Wash kind of joins into the San Diego Creek, which is the main discharge point into the upper Newport Bay. So looking at this map, this is the same map, but just kind of telling a little bit of a different story. So the blue line is the San Diego Creek watershed boundary. And then within the blue line, you see all of the orange dots, which are all of our natural treatment system locations. And a natural treatment system is our word or our term for our urban treatment wetlands. So these are all treatment wetlands built into the urban environment. And then just to notice down here, number 46, that is our biggest wetland. That is the San Joaquin Marsh, which is the lowest point in the watershed before the water is discharged into the back bay. Okay, so how a natural treatment system works. It's actually pretty simple if you think about it. Irvine is a master plan city. And so they kind of had this foresight to introduce these treatment wetlands as a way for managing our water flow throughout the watershed and for protect, really protecting our coastline. So in the urban environment, these are just neighborhoods, maybe strip malls, even next to a sports park, there will be built a natural wetland. Well, it's a man-made wetland, but it's all natural components. So say you wash your truck, or your dog or water your lawn, anything that goes down the gutter would eventually end up as at the ocean. But in our case, we've created these wetlands where the water flows through these wetlands to clean, to get all nice and clean before it goes out to the ocean. So this water that's coming into our treatment wetlands is usually full of nitrogen, phosphorus, there's greases. If your car is leaking oil on the street, it's going to run into our wetland um, and sometimes some harmful bacteria. So the wetland is receiving all of this urban runoff, but we've planted these wetlands with native plant species that really have a great effect on the water quality. The plants uptake and utilize nutrients and build biomass um, via photosynthesis. Also, a lot of nutrients are kind of sticky and they like to stick to clay and sediment particles, especially phosphorus. So phosphorus binds to sediment and these wetlands kind of give the water some time to slow down and these particles to really settle out of the water. We also have um, just that whole slowing down motion of a wetland. We're able to let harmful bacteria get treated by UV light. So UV light is a natural antibacterial mechanism, and that is kind of an awesome um, trait for our wetlands. So then the water leaving our wetlands is much cleaner than the water that came in. So this is a overhead view of one of our NTS sites. This is Forge Meadows. And if any of you have been up along Portola in Irvine, it's kind of up near the foothills. It's Portola and Forge. And as you can see, this wetland is built right into a neighborhood and it's actually all of the water flowing through it is coming out of this neighborhood. So off the lawns, down the gutter, right into this wetland. So all of our wetlands are comprised of an inlet structure that deposits the water into the settling basin. So the settling basin slows the water down. Remember this water is being shot out not shot out, but kind of channeled through a pipe. And this is slowing it down, spreading it out, letting the sediments um, trickle out. 
And this entire wetland is planted with juncus species, bulrush, cattails, all of these native wetland plants that are hungry for nutrients, which is good because they're removing it from the water column and building biomass instead. So the water moves from the settling basin into this channel where it has a lot of interactions with natural plants and then is deposited into the outlet pond. And the outlet pond once again spreads out the water where the UV light can penetrate the water column and kill the harmful bacteria that we've talked about. Before the water is discharged at the outlet, it flows through a trash screen. So luckily we have installed these trash screens and we actually clean the trash screens probably bi-monthly um, depending on any storm events. And so we're not only cleaning the water chemistry, but we're also cleaning out debris that would otherwise end up downstream. So I just wanted to give you an idea of all the different shapes and sizes these wetlands come in. Um, this is just six and we remember we have over 40. Um, so it's not just like a one size fits all, it kind of depends on the size of the neighborhood they're draining and the location of, of these wetlands. So some wetlands have multiple inlets coming from maybe multiple streets. Some wetlands only have one inlet, but they all have that kind of settling basin, channel, outlet pond, and then outlet structure components to it. Now, if you look in the upper right, marsh burn retarding basin, it's actually a flood retarding basin. So the vast majority of the year, we have like over 340 dry days, I believe in SoCal. Um, it's acting as a normal wetland, but during rain events, it has the ability to fill up so that the neighborhoods are not flooded. So this can have two, um, it's a storm management wetland, but then also for the majority of the year, it's acting as a natural urban runoff treatment wetland. So how and what do we monitor? This is one of my favorite parts of my job is actually getting in the wetlands. This is not me, this is my um, good friend and coworker, Cheryl, but we monitor the flow. So how much water is coming in, how much water is leaving our wetlands, the physical water quality. So the temperature, the pH, is it too basic? Is it too acidic? how much dissolved oxygen is in the water coming in and how much dissolved oxygen is leaving the wetlands. Conductivity, which is a indicator of the ions in the wetlands. So kind of salts, how much, um, it's really the ability to conduct electricity, which is a physical water quality parameter. And then our last is turbidity. Is the water murky? Is it clear? Are we improving the water quality that way? And then our third um, monitoring realm is water chemistry. And so with that, we actually take physical water samples in jars and we have a great water quality um, analytic lab at IRWD where they look at the water chemistry. So they're usually looking at species such as nitrate, nitrite, other um, nitrogen species like ammonia or TKN, total phosphorus, selenium, which is an issue in our watershed, as well as total dissolved solids. So with all of this data that we're collecting, we um, are able to kind of create a picture about how our wetlands are working. At a water district, we wanna clean our water. So we wanna make them as efficient and um, clean as possible. So with that, all of that data that we've collected out in the field, we're able to look at site removals. So I know this looks like a lot of numbers and tables to kind of absorb, but every year, really every month, but every year I try and put together how many pounds of removal for different analytes. So if you're looking at the first table, this is all of the NTS sites combined. So that's the 40 something sites combined. And all of these numbers are in pounds. So we're able to look at flow in relation to concentration and get the difference between the inlet versus the outlet, which would be our removal rate. 
So for instance, total nitrogen, we removed nearly 70,000 pounds of total nitrogen in our watershed from these urban treatment wetlands last year alone, um, as well as 262 pounds of selenium, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a lot of selenium. Um, in the second table, this is the percent removal of three strains of potentially harmful bacteria. So Los Olivos is one of our regular NTS sites. The San Joaquin Marsh, SJM, is that big and, um, NTS wetland site that we talked about earlier. So we're looking at some very, very high percent removals, nearly 100%. So these sites are really removing these bacteria. And um, as someone who likes to go to the beach, that is a huge deal because a lot of times beaches are closed due to harmful bacteria. So this is a really big deal for our whole watershed and our coastline. So just to review how this is all happening in the wetland, there are no pumps. We do not put any chemicals in our wetlands. This is au natural. So plant uptake is able to uptake and remove nutrients because plants require nutrients to photosynthesize. Sedimentation allows this water that is shooting down our gutters to really slow down and sediments can kind of trickle out, which um, a lot, most sediments are bound by nutrients. Denitrification is a fancy word for the natural process of turning nitrate into nitrogen gas, which is what we breathe every day. UV treatment is um, obviously the sun penetrating the water column to kill harmful bacteria. And then volatilization is the natural process of removing ammonia or ammonium, excuse me, from the water column. Okay, the San Joaquin Marsh. Going back to this map, the San Joaquin Marsh, just like PJ had illustrated, it's at the very bottom of our watershed right before it goes out to the Newport Back Bay. So it's right along the San Diego Creek and this is actually an aerial image of it. This is the water district that, um, that's where my office is located um, pre-COVID. And this is the San Diego Creek. So as this entire watershed drains, the Peters Canyon Wash and the San Diego Creek tie up and just become the San Diego Creek that is our main discharge channel. So as the water is coming down, we have created a dam right here that's allowing us to pump water up into this ponded marsh. So the way it works is the water is pumped up and then it is gravity, um, just gravity uses, it's just gravity that makes the water flow from pond to pond. So it flows from pond A to B to one through six. And that entire channel or that entire um, trip is about 21 days. So we would call that a residence time in science terms. So with an increased residence time like that, these natural processes are really able to kind of take effect. And we're seeing a really good increase in water quality from the start to the finish. So once the water reaches pond six right here, it gets pumped into this pump station and goes directly back out to the creek downstream of this intake pipe. So then this water goes out to the Newport Bay and it has been completely treated by these natural treatment sites. So the marsh itself is about 280 acres and um, there's actually a 22% flow reduction via evaporation, inundation, and then um, plant utilization. So we're decreasing the amount of the total amount of urban runoff leading to the ocean. And then last year alone, we treated over 44,000 pounds of nitrogen. So that's what we removed via this marsh, along with over 188 pounds of selenium just from this one marsh. So this is kind of a powerhouse and it's also open to the public from dawn to dusk. I highly recommend going. 
There's over 13 miles of trail. Um, and it's also just a really great nature sanctuary. So some of the benefits of the San Joaquin Marsh, the most obvious one is improved water quality. It is our kind of crown jewel of the water district for as far as wetlands go. It also is a super cost effective way for meeting regulatory requirements for Orange County. Um, it definitely enhances habitat and aesthetics of the area. This, you would never know you're in such an urban jungle if you get to go into the marsh. It's really a special place. And then also it's a great learning environment for kids and for the general public. My second favorite part of my job is biological monitoring and native plant restoration. So IRWD has been very committed to reducing the amount of pesticides and herbicides we use in our practices. And um, I got really excited about that. So I was able to um, get a bunch of people on board to start restoring areas of the marsh that have kind of been inundated by weeds. Weeds pop up anywhere, especially anywhere where you disturb soil and have to remove dead material, which we do sometimes in the marsh. But to instead of provide um, instead of killing weeds with herbicide, we instead have tried doing it the natural way by using native plant restoration, which is um, very competitive plant heavy. So we're looking at plants that are um, native, hardy, long lived, and drought tolerant. And so we're reintroducing these plants into the marsh to kind of um, strong arm out all, all of the weeds. Also, the last thing I wanted to share about the marsh is the Sea and Sage Audubon Society. I highly recommend visiting their website. If you want to learn anything about birds, I know I need to brush up on it quite a bit. Um, but this is the, an awesome place to learn about birds, look at bird counts. Each month they post different counts of birds that have been spotted in, in the marsh. Um, and a lot of them are rare and protected species. So I highly recommend visiting their site. And with that, I am through. I am very happy to answer any questions. The marsh um, and all of our NTS site, sites were created um, from 1998 and then through the present. So before the marsh and all of the NTS sites were created, we were having huge issues with algal blooms in the back bay. Mm -hmm. And these harmful algal blooms are very detrimental to marine life. So um, a big fancy term, I guess it's eutrophication. So that's when there are a ton of nutrients coming into an area causing this algae bloom that can actually outcompete and kill a bunch of marine life through a series of events. Um, so after the implementation of these NTS sites, we've seen a big decrease in that. So we're seeing an increase in water quality and a decrease in these harmful algae blooms. So um, it's kind of like as many wetlands as we're able to incorporate, we're really catching all of this urban runoff before it heads out to the ocean. So um, of course there's gonna be pollutants from the harbor, but um, they're kind of starting off on the right foot with a cleaner, cleaner set of water. That's a hard one because I, I try to say no data is bad. It's just like, Okay, it's, it's telling you something. So TKN is total ketal nitrogen. And that is the sum of organic nitrogen and ammonium. So what you're seeing, if you're seeing a negative, that means that there is biological production in your site. So it's kind of, um, nitrogen is very labile and it kind of moves between oxidation states um, and so with that species, it's just indicating that, okay, there is quite a bit of nitrogen composed in organic material. So that can be good or bad, but it's also um, kind of what's expected in wetlands and it's telling a story of what, how the nitrogen is reacting in that wetland.
in Southern California, we're not seeing a ton of rain. We don't have a super wet climate. And we actually see some of our largest flows through our wetlands during the dry months. So that is telling us, you know, if I'm looking at our flow um, measurements and, and August and September, we're seeing massive amounts of flow through our wetlands. Um, and, but the temperatures have just been skyrocketing. That's telling a story of how we are trying to adapt our plants, our landscaping, everything to this extreme heat. So we tend to overwater. We tend to, um, you know, play with the hose in the in the driveway and kind of adapt to this like shift in climate. To we don't see any sort of summer like rain events usually. Um, so kind of measuring these changes in flows over time, we're able to see kind of how humans are really reacting to this sort of climate change, I would say. So last year alone, we had 1.66 billion gallons coming through. Um, I wrote that number down uh, earlier today because I, I was like, I need to bring this up. It's pretty crazy. And this is all urban runoff. So some of it is comprised of groundwater that, that pilots that reaches the surface. Um, but most of it is stuff going down the gutter. Um, so we have flow meters that are installed in a lot of our sites at the inflow pipes and the outflow pipes so that we can see the difference in, um, you know, how much is flowing in, how much is evaporating and inundating or being utilized by plant species and how much is leaving. And that helps us get our um, amount of removals of certain um, constituents of concern. But that flow is measured through these um, ultrasonic flow meters that we have. And it's a lot of water moving, yeah. I actually, I feel like I've known about it growing up in like a coastal town. I feel like I've known about kelp and seaweed and everything for so long. But then as my education progressed through high school and then college, I was able to see that um, it's really um, phycology, like the basis, algae is like the basis for almost everything in the marine world. So that kind of brought, like piqued my interest. And then I went one step further and wanted to study ocean chemistry because really that is what is um, controlling it all. That's the chemistry always gets pushed to the side because it's not as exciting, but really that's like the brains and the operation. Um, and so I kind of found a balance between the both of those. And I just kind of went for it. I just went after what I thought was interesting, really. Um, my mom was a pharmacologist, so, but she was, so she was more on the chemistry side of things. My dad is an artist as well. And so, and he is more of that art brain, but I feel like science really encompasses both of them. Um, and I don't think, I feel like science is so um, thought of as maybe scary for young people. Like, oh, like actually I failed chemistry at UC Santa Barbara the first time I took it. Um, you know, I cried over it. I called my parents over it. What do I do? But I think that that was a turning point for me because I could have either said, it's too hard, I'm scared of it. But instead I said, well, I need to get through this because I want to be a marine scientist. I gotta, I gotta do that. And I think that if you're not scared to fail, that is more important than almost anything. Um, you fail a lot as a scientist. Experiments go wrong. Months of data collection goes down the drain if you missed a, a part of it. And um, I think that if I could say anything to younger people looking at being in a science world if they know that actually it is a creative um, realm, it's not very rigid and that it's okay to fail because you won't fail forever. <laughs> You're gonna figure it out. Um, that's kind of my advice, I think. <laughs>